honored and, and pleased to be with you. Thank, thank you for inviting me. This is a good, good thing for me to do to get ready for a presentation with, with you. Let me, you, you can read that for a minute here. So I'm going to start out with a little bit of history of when kind of the study of probability began. So we'll do a, you read that okay? Does someone need, need help? Okay. All right. So what do you think? Which of those two do you think is more likely? The second one? Well, the second one is more restrictive than the first one, is it not? So it's going to be harder to meet the conditions of the second one. Okay. So I think, you know, we're not born with a probability gene. So sometimes things that turn out to be true according to probability theory aren't things that we naturally would have th thought. But anyway, we're going to... All right. So probability got its beginning with gamblers and with collection of, of data. We're going to look mostly at, at the beginnings in, in gambling, but we'll look a little bit at the collection of data also. So it started with with uh, gamblers in, in France and got picked up by the mathematicians. So go back just a little bit before the gamblers in, in, in France. And this is a game that was played in Egypt. And what I want to look at, let's see how this works. And you see these guys right here are actually they're called astragalus, and they're heel bone from a sheep or a deer, kind of a small critter, and they were thrown like we would throw dice today. So these are some blown up pictures of them, and I've been told that they're, if you see them in the museum that they're kind of nice, they're smooth from people having handled them. But you can imagine that if you roll this, that the probabilities that you get a particular face varies from face to face. And what happens with my bones are not the same as what happens with, with, with your bones. So it took the evolution of these to, to dice, and the first dice were very rough. But then as the dice got more uniform, then it's going to become possible to make some sort of generalizations about them. So supposedly the theory of probability got started when de Mare, who some people say was a gambler, some say he just heard this from other gamblers, but he visited Pascal and told him about two problems that puzzled the, the, the gamblers. And Pascal is the same guy that wrote Pensies. So I want to tell you what the two problems were. So one had to do with dice. And the gamblers noticed that if one, one of the things that they did was to roll a single die four times and wonder what the chance is of getting an ace. And an ace is a one coming up. So I want to know if I roll the dice four times, what's the chance I get a, a one? And opposed to that was, what happens if I roll two dice and look for the sum, not the sum, but look for the, when the dice come up, both ones. Right? And they roll it 24 times. Okay, so this is, this is a diagram of two dice, just so we can keep track, a red one and a green one. So the top row shows what happens when the red die is a one and, and then all the possibilities for a green die and so on. So there's six rows. Each row has six possibilities in it. So when I roll two dice, there are 36 different things that can happen. 
And only one of those 36 in the upper left-hand corner is that double A's. Right? So one out of 36 possibilities gives me the double A's. Right? So here's, here, here's the question that the gamblers wondered about. They said, okay, if I roll a single die four times, and I look at, well, a, an ace can come up one-sixth of the time, one out of the six possibilities. One-sixth of four is two-thirds. Right. If I look at the other problem of rolling a paradise 24 times, right, the chances of getting a double ace are just one out of 36. If I go one third out of 36 of 24, that's also two-thirds. However, they noticed that the first event of rolling a single die four times, that you get one ace a little more than half the time. But in the second event of if I roll two dice 24 times, the double ace comes up a little less than half the time. So why is that? That's, that's one of the questions that then Demare told Pascal. Okay, the other one was this called the problem of points. And it's two people are playing, probably not Chris and Sandy, that doesn't sound like a very good Frenchman, but anyway, they were Chris and Sandy. And the way they play this game is they have rounds that you play, and, and, and on each round, one of the players wins. And we're going to assume that the players have equal ability or whatever, so it's equally likely that one wins as the other. So they agree to play this. You play this game until one of the players has won six rounds. And it happens in this particular one we're looking at is the game's interrupted when Chris has won four rounds and Sandy three. And so they, they're betting. So there's some money out there in the middle. And the question is, how do we divide up the money then? Okay. So one's a little bit ahead. What do I do? Okay. Well, Pascal knew that there's this guy named Fermat. And Fermat's pretty amazing. He's a lawyer, basically, but he does mathematics on the side and is probably the best mathematician of his age. And so they have a correspondence in, in letters that go back and forth. And we'll, I want to do an aside for a minute because Fermat's name, one of the things Fermat did was he did some of the beginning work for calculus, which was finished off by Newton and Leibniz, so he doesn't get his name attached to it. But his name lived on because of a particular problem. So we gotta, we're taking a detour here, all right? So here's the Pythagorean theorem. So I've got a right triangle up there, A, B, and C, C on the hypotenuse. So the Pythagorean theorem says that the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the two sides. And what's interesting is that you can solve that for any triangle, but there are, sometimes there are whole numbers that work out and they're called the Pythagorean triples. So they're written over the side. So like three, four, and five is probably the simplest Pythagorean triple. So if I square three, I get nine. Square four, I get 16. Nine plus 16 is 25, which is five squared. And if I do five, 12, and 13, what, five squared is 25. 12 squared is 144. I add those, I get 169, which is 13 squared. I'll let you do the other one. <laughs> I got to tell a math joke. Math, math jokes are kind of interesting just because they're so bad. But so, so teacher says, so this is grade school teacher. They're, they're studying the Pythagorean theorem. And, and the te teacher says, Johnny, if I tell you what C and A is, can you find B? And he says, sure. It's right there. <laughs> OK. Go on. So Fermat was reading a book by a Greek mathematician, Diophantus, who was interested in a number theory. And he wrote this in the margin. He says, if an integer n is greater than 2, then a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n has no solutions in whole numbers. He says, I have a truly marvelous proof 
of this proposition, which this margin is too narrow to contain. <laughs> so see, if that n up there is a, is a 2, then, then we have the Pythagorean theorem. We have a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And there are whole number solutions like 3, 4, and 5, 5, 12, and 15. So if you put a 3 in there, say a cubed plus b cubed equals c cubed, can't find any whole numbers, he said, and so on. Well, so this became known as Fermat's last theorem. And mathematicians struggled for years and years with this because they were so intrigued by it. I mean, it's very simple to, to, to state, and nobody could solve it. It wasn't in vain because a lot of interesting mathematics got created in the struggle to, to find it. And then recently, the English mathematician John Wiles did a proof, and there's a wonderful NOVA program about this. And he just, when he tries to tell about doing it, he just breaks down and cries. He, he had wanted to do this since he was a kid. And, uh, you know, and, and to have done this, in spite of all the great mathematicians that, that had tried. Anyway, was, he got a couple of good prizes for, for his efforts. Okay, so look at the anal I'm going to look at the two problems that de Meer gave to Pascal and Pascal and Fermat worked on. So the first one is, what's the chance of at least one ace in four rolls of a die? Well, so it says at least one ace. So I could get one ace or two aces or three aces or maybe even all four of them aces. So it's a little easier in this case to count what you don't want than what you do want. So if I do that, I say, okay, well, on the first roll, okay, what, what's the chance I don't get an ace? Well, five-sixths of the time, I don't get an ace. Second roll, five-sixths. Third roll, five-sixths. Fourth roll, five-sixths. I multiply those together, and that gives me the chance I don't get any aces. So I subtract that from one, and that tells me what's the chance that I do get an ace, at least one. So that's 0.5177 if you work it out. So I'm going to do a similar thing for what happens when I roll two dice 24 times. So here, what happens is that then if I'm not going to get two aces, there are 35 other things that can happen. So if I roll, I say, what's my chance I don't get a double ace? It's 35 out of 36. And I'm going to do that 24 times. So I'm going to multiply... 35 over 36 times itself, 24 times, and that tells me the chance I don't get any double aces, and I subtract that from one, and that tells me the chance that I get at least one double ace. And that's 0.4914. So here, so the, so the chance of the first event's a little over 50%, and the other one's a little under 50%. So kind of the amazing thing is how those French gamblers knew that, <laughs> From all the times they had played, you know, they didn't, they didn't know how to calculate it. Okay. So I want to look at the analysis of, of points. So, so the problem was they play until somebody's won six rounds. And Chris has already won four and Sandy three. Well, the insight that Pascal and Fermat had was says, let's look at this as though they played four more rounds. And the reason four more rounds is, let's see, if, if Chris has won four rounds, I want to think of what's, what's the most rounds that could happen until somebody wins. So, Chris just needs to win one, win one more, six, two more rounds. So if he wins one more, if he wins one more, then he's got five. And if Sandy wins two more, then he or she has five, right? So three games is going to possibly give a tie. And then by then in the, in the fourth game, someone will have to win, okay? So it's, it takes at most four more rounds before somebody's going to have six wins. So they said, okay, let's consider four more rounds. So in those four rounds, I have lots of different things that can happen. So I just wrote down a couple of them. Chris wins the first game, then Sandy, then Chris, then Sandy, or Sandy, Sandy, Chris, then Sandy. So I want to count how many combinations are there and how many of those 
combinations. Does Chris win at least two rounds, which would make him the, the winner? So I'm going to do another diversion and talk about counting just for a little bit. All right. So I want to talk about particular counting as if I have a collection. Just said the alphabet, for instance. I've got 26 different objects, and I want to choose four of them out. Okay. And that without replacement means that if I pick a letter out and choose it, then I can't choose it again. So it's not like license plates where I can you know, have two A's and a C in my license plate. So, so there are two different things I want to count. First one is called a permutation, which is if the order makes a difference in what I get. So in a permutation, if I had the letters F, R, X, V, and then another instance I had R, F, V, X, those are two different permutations, although they have the same letters, because the letters appear in different orders. So if I want to count those, I come down and I think, okay, I'm going to pick a letter out. I have 26 different choices for that first letter. Second letter, I have 25 choices because I can't choose the one that I picked first time. And then 24 and 23. So if I multiply those together, that gives me the number of permutations of four things taken out of 26. So another way to count is, instead of permutations, I want to look at combinations. And the difference in combinations is that order doesn't matter. So like a, if I'm playing poker and I get five cards in my hand, I don't care which order they were dealt to me. I just care with about the five cards that I ended up with. Okay, so, so now, in combinations, FRVX and RFVX are the same combination because right? they have the same letters, even though they're in a different order. So if I'm going to count those, I'm going to start out in the numerator there, 26 times 25 times 24 times 23 is the number of permutations. But, but if I look at a particular group of four letters, like the FRVX, I say, hey, how many different ways are there to rearrange those four letters? Well, you can got four letters, you got four ways to pick the first one, three ways to pick the second one, two ways to pick the next one. So I'm going to divide that out by the four times three times two. And that tells me the number of combinations then of 26 things taken four at a time. And there's a shorthand notation for that given down at the bottom with those parentheses with a 26 over a four. And sometimes that's read as 26 choose four. All right. So this is, Pascal gets his name attached to this triangle, and it has something to do with combinations, which we'll see in a minute. But so there's, you can write this triangle in different ways, but there's ones all down the outside. Then the numbers on the inside, a simple way to build them is just to add the two numbers above. So let's see if I can get one here. Like the three here, you add the one and the two to get the three. The 6 is 3 and 3, this 10 is 4 and 6, and this 15, which is marked as 5 and 10. Okay? So, <laughs> these numbers appear, let me just tell you very briefly, they're also the numbers that appear in a, what's called a binomial coefficient. So if you take the quantity a plus b and square it, you get a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. Those are the numbers that appear in that second row. If I take a plus b and cube it, I get a cubed plus 2a squared b plus, I'm sorry, I get, I get, I get a cubed, I get 3a squared b plus 3ab squared plus b cubed, and that's the numbers in the third row. But what's interesting to us is, is that these are actually the, the combinations. So if you look at this fifth row down here, these are the combinations of five things. The first one is taken, you don't take any. This is five things taken one at a time. This is five things taken two at a time. So that's, that's the combinations of five. How many combinations of two things you can get out of five? The other 10 is five choose three. 
that's the number of combinations of five things taken three at a time. And, and then the last five is what happens if you do five things taken four at a time. There's only, there are five ways to do that. And then the last one is if you choose them all, there's one way to do that. Okay. So th this is the triangle written again with the, the combinations instead of the numbers written in with the symbolic. Okay. So Pascal get his name attached to this. However, <laughs> Chinese beat him to it by quite a bit. And actually this happens in, in, in mathematics and then in the other sciences too, is that it's often not the person that first thought of the thing, but it's kind of the person that kind of applied it and made it well known. And okay. So we're back to division of, of the pot. So this was uh, back to Sandy and Chris. So we said we're going to look at four more rounds. So how many more, how many more combinations are there? Well, there's up there that two times two times two is. The first two represents who, how many choices are there? Who wins the first round? Well, either Sandy or Chris. Same second round, so on. So there's 16 different. possibilities we, we could write down. What, what we're wondering, Chris has already won four rounds. We want to know what's the chance that he wins at least two more. Okay. So that four choose two says that he wins two of the rounds out of the four. Then the four choose three, he uses three. And the four choose four, he, he, he wins four. And those add up to 11 out of the 16 possibilities. So. Chris takes 11 sixteenths of the pot, and the rest, 5 sixteenths of the pot, Sandy takes. And that was the solution that Fairmont and Pascal did. All right, so I'm going to switch just a minute to collection of, of data. The, the two instances I have happened in e England. And this bills of mortality, the king asked all the parishes in London to keep track of christenings, and deaths and marriages. So this appeal, then they put it together in this bill of mortality, which shows on the right. I'll show you a little bit more of that in the in the next slide. But there was a guy that this John Grant that got really in, in intrigued by the bills of mortality. He was not a mathematician. He was, I think, sold hats. He was one of the things he was interested in is what the population of London was going to do over the next few years. And so he looked at women, and I don't remember the ages he used that he, he thought were of age to have babies, and assumed that they'd have a baby every two years, <laughs> and used that to predict how, what, what the population of, how the population of London would, would, would grow. This is that bottom part of it, of the Bill of Mortality. And they're a little hard to read in this because it's not a great copy. And it's, but there's, I don't know, see if we can read one here together. Here's Colic and Wind, 134. Here's Flocks and Small, oh, 655. And this was in 1665, it was a plague year. There were like 68,000 plague. And he's got them. So Edmund Halley, this is the same astronomer Halley, this Halley's comet is his name for, uh, picked up on what Ground had done and actually calculated these life, life tables, which are very much like what the insurance company do, you use now. So for a person of a given age, how, much, how likely it is they're going to live so many years beyond that time. Uh, at about the same time, Edward Lloyd founded a coffee house in, in, in London that a lot of the ship people came to. And he kept very detailed records of the ships and who was captain, where they were sailing to, what they carried, if they had any difficulties along the way. 
And so there was a lot of risk in shipments and some lost. And so some brokers started to write up contracts that were like risk policies. And some of the other people in the coffee house would act as those that were willing to assume some of the risk. So the broker would have a contract and these people would sign underneath, assuming so much of the risk, and they became known as underwriters then. Okay. And a little later, after they'd done this for a while, they together formed the Society of Lloyds, which became Lloyds of London. Okay, so what's, what is probability? We've been talking about it. There are at least three different ways to, to look at it. So when we say, what do we mean by a 40% chance of an event to occur? I think probably the one we'll talk about most is fre frequencies. So we talk about flipping a coin, for instance. If I flip a coin a lot of times, I expect that a head will come up about half of those times and a tail half of those times. So I repeat that same thing over and over again. Another one is degrees of belief. I doubt that I have a 40% chance of getting into my wife's chocolate without getting caught. <laughs> uh, another way to interpret probability is degrees of evidential support. So like weather prediction, I don't expect tomorrow to be exactly like any other day that's ever been, but I've got some evidence for particular conditions and what the high pressures are doing and what the winds are doing. And, and, and so the, you know, the paper tells me there's a 40% chance of rain tomorrow or whatever. Okay. Uh, in the 1900s, this is a Russian mathematician, Komogorov, wrote down some sim simple axioms that he said probability should always follow. So the first one says probability of any events, a number between zero and one, which we often interpret as a percent. Probability of a certain event is one, of an impossible event is zero. And then he had one kind of little more than that. The probability of event A or event B is the probability of event A plus the probability of event B if, if they're incompatible e events. Okay. So particular cases of that, if, if I say, what's the, if I roll a pair of dice and I say, what's the probability of the sum of 7 or 11, I can't get both of those. So I can add the probability of getting a 7 to the probability of getting an 11 to know the probability that I get either one. But what I can't do is if I say I have, a, what's the probability that a adult is a tall or has blue eyes, I, I can't add the two probabilities because there's an overlap between being tall and having blue eyes. So Laplace was a scientist, mathematician, did, did amazing things in both physics and mathematics. Oh, he wrote this. It's, he says, it's remarkable that a science which began with the consideration of games of chance sort of become the most important object of human knowledge. Well, he didn't, didn't worry about the human people in humanity. <laughs> So we're going to look at, at th three things in, in gambling where probability plays an important role. So this is, this is for a poker, five-card stud to straight poker. So this is the... So these are some of the possible hands. So straight, straight means the cards are in sequence. Flush means they're all of the same suit. And so the highest ranked one is royal flush, which is actually just a special case of a straight flush, which means the cards are in sequence and of the same suit, right? Then they go on down from there, right? Four of a kind, full house means three of a kind and a pair. Flush means all of the same suit, but could be different orders. So look, look, look at one, one is, this is, so the number of possible hands is, I got 52 cards, choose five. So 
So that's about two and a half million different possibilities for a poker hand that you could have. So we're going to look at just one of the possibilities is, is a full house. So a full house has a three of a kind and then a pair. So that 13 represents choosing which of the 13 different kinds you're going to have the, the, the three of a kind in. So say I choose queens. Right? So, then I'm, so now I've got queens, but now I can, out of the four queens, I want to choose three of those. So that's the four, choose three. Then the 12 is I've got 12 kinds left after I've done queens. Right? I've got kings and sevens and eights. And whatever. So out of those 12, I'm going to choose one of the other kinds for the pair. And then once I do that, then I'm going to choose two of those for my pair. So that's four, choose two. You do that, and there's 3,744 different full houses you, you, you could have. Right? So the probability of getting a full house is that you take that 3744 and divide it by the two and a half million and you get like 0.00144. So it's the chance of getting dealt a full house is a little less chance than <laughs> flipping a coin and getting nine heads in a row. So the, we're not gonna go through this, but these are the different hands. <laughs> listed, and then you can either think of them as listed by how many different possibilities there are or by the chance you'd get them. So most of them have very small chance till you get down to like one one pair. Uh, kind of interesting, if you add all those percents up on the right, they're just a little bit under 50 percent. So on to roulette. So here's the roulette wheel. So they're 30, 36 numbers that are colored red and black. Some of those are odd and some are even, and they're mixed in, odd and even are mixed in the red and the black. And then there's two other slots, the two green ones with a zero and a double zero. Okay. I've been told that in Monte Carlo, there's only a, a zero, not a double zero. I wrote a sabbatical pro proposal once to go check that out. <laughs> But, but it didn't get approved. <laughs> okay. So anyway, you know, they put the ball in, it spins, and it ends up in one of those spots. So you can do lots of different bets. This is part of the, of the table. So I can bet on red or bet on black. I can bet on odd or even. I can bet on groups of numbers. I can put a chips in, kind of in the middle and bet on four different numbers. Okay. So I'm going to take a short diversion again here. All right. So this is Jacob, sometimes called Jane, James Bernoulli. He was part of a, a family at the time of brothers and cousins and nephews. And that was just amazing. I mean, so several of them were outstanding mathematicians and, and, and scientists. So he did many wonderful things, but he thought this one was pretty special, was what he called his, his golden theorem. And so he tells, this is therefore the problem that I now want to publish here, having considered it closely for a period of 20 years, and it is a problem of which the novelty, as well as the high utility, gather with its grave difficulty, exceed in weight and value all the remaining chapters of my doctrine. Well, what, what his golden theorem was, was the law of large numbers or the law of averages, uh, sometimes popularly called. So what it says is if you have a random event that's repeated n times and you average up the results, as n increases, this average will approach the value of the event. So if you look at that and say in terms of tossing a fair coin, fair coin, fair is used just to mean that the coin equally likely to come up heads or tails. It's not weighted. So it says, if you toss a fair coin over and over and over again, as that number of times that you toss it in increases, the fraction of heads will approach a half. So an example is if you 
we, we can just label a head as one and a tail as, as zero. And, and suppose we get this particular sequence, heads, heads, tails, heads, so on. There are four heads in there, so the average result is four tenths. So, okay. so what it says is I can, if I do this for more and more flips, so for instance, suppose I do 100 flips and I get 46 heads and 54 tails, then the average result is 0.46. So that's off, off from five tenths by four heads, right? If there were four more heads, then I'd have 50-50. In 10,000 flips, say we do that, and it turns out maybe we get 4,950 heads and, and 5,050 tails. Then the average result is 4,950 over 10,000, which is 0.495. Well, so, so look, this, this, this is actually off by 50 heads, and the previous one was off by five heads, but, but my percent is closer to five tenths. And that's what the law of averages says. The law of averages says if you do this lots and lots of times, right, it may be that the number of heads is just overwhelmed by how, how many flips you've done, the number of heads that you could be off could be quite large if the number of flips is really large. Right? So the law of large numbers doesn't predict what's going to happen in the next few flips. Right? It only tells you what's happening in the long run. So, there's no, so it's nonsense to say, hey, I've seen more heads than tails. I, I think that the next flip is going to be a tail. No. That's not, that's, not, that's not the way it goes. So I tell you, who, the casinos and the insurance companies live by the law of averages. <laughs> Gam gamblers and policy, policy holders don't. Well, I mean, the insurance companies I exist, right? So, so, I mean, so they must make money on their premiums. So, so they're taking in a lot more than what they pay out. And same for the casino. Now, that doesn't mean you don't want to gamble and you don't want to buy an insurance policy. I mean, I might gamble because, you know, it's, it's exciting and fun to do and I like to go to the buffet and go to a show and whatever. Okay? And same for an in, in insurance policy. I like the fact that it, you know, give, gives me a sense of sec security. Okay, so here's winning at, at roulette. So you bet on red. And a win pays two to one. Okay? What that means is that if you bet a dollar, you get two dollars if you win back, all right? So you really won a dollar because you had to pay a dollar to, to play. Well, you know, the way they figure the odds for this, it would be, it'd be fair, gambler and casino, if they didn't have that zero and double zero, all right? Those are the guys that throw it for the house. Right? So if I come down here, what are my expected winnings? Well, I win a dollar when it comes up red. There are 18 red numbers out of 38, because there's 36 red and black numbers plus the two green ones. So 18 38ths of the time, I win a dollar. And then 20 38ths of the time, I lose my dollar. Okay? So the net is five cents every time I bet a buck. Now, now, that's not going to happen to me every time I, I bet a buck, right? I mean, sometimes I'm going to win. But what happens to the house with the law of averages? They're making five cents every time. They're making 5% in, in the long run. Right? Same thing happens with whatever you, whatever you bet. You, you can bet on a cluster of four numbers. It, it pays 9 to 1. So if you hit... You win eight dollars. If you lose your dollar, it turns out to lose five cents again. They're all 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 the bets are that way. See what what, what makes a good game for the, for the ca ca casino in, in many ways is where they they don't want to win big on any one play. All right, they want you to be enticed enough, you know, that you have a decent chance of of winning, but not in the long run. So you might go over and win for a day, win for two days, but probably not for your lifetime. Okay. 
I want to look at one more at Oregon Mega Box. So we'll look, we'll look at, at Oregon Lottery, just this one one game of theirs. So Mega Box began in 1985 with a law passed by the legislator, le legislature, and it was actually the numbers were went from one to 38, and the computer randomly chose six of those, and you pick six not knowing what the computer was yet, and then you win the jackpot if all of your numbers match. There are other ways that you can win some money. Right? So what's happened is Megabox has evolved now to instead of two drawings a week. I think it used to be Wednesday and Saturday. Now they're Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. And it's evolved to have, instead of 38 numbers, 48. That's happened slowly. They've moved the numbers up, and I, I did a little bit of work for them early on, because what, what they're interested in is, so you, if you change the, from 38 to 48, the, the 48 is going to give more combinations, and it's going to be harder to win an individual, with an in, individual ticket. So the way Megabox works is that if nobody wins, then the jackpot gets increased by a minimum amount. I think it's like, I think it starts at 1 million and goes up 250,000 at least. But if a lot of people are playing and money's coming in, then it goes up by even more than that. So what they'd like to do is have runs of nobody winning, right? So the jackpot gets really big, and then people that don't normally play are going to come in and play and other people are going to buy more, more, more tickets. But you don't want it too hard, right? <laughs> I mean, you don't want it to run for the whole, whole year because then people will, will give up and get dis discouraged. So here, so you're choosing six numbers out of 48. There's 12 mil million of those. Right. So your chance of winning I think we get another one. How does this sound? <laughs> okay. So your chance of winning is actually, when, when you buy a dollar ticket, you, when you buy pay a dollar, you get two tickets. So you get two chances. In it. But this chance of winning, one out of 12 million, is kind of like getting 23 heads in a row. So. All right. Uh, this is just a, an aside, because sometimes probability is stated in terms of odds. So if you have odds like six to four in favor of Fran, you take the six and put it over the total, and that gives you the probability. So these are some current probability applications, and we'll talk about a couple of these. Right. This down about the fourth one down, the actuarial science. Uh, so a actuaries are the folks that figure out what the premium should be and how the structure of the premiums go. And they know a lot of probability. And they, the American Association of Actuaries has exams and you can get to certain levels like an associate or fellow and you take like, I think, five exams to get to an associate and 10 to get to be a fellow. And uh, they have one, one test is just pure probability. And that's what the test is on, probability. And the other tests that are more advanced have probability, but used as an application in the insurance biz business. So the actuary is mostly in places like Hartford, Connecticut, and Chicago, Los Angeles, and they folks that try to work their way through this have study groups. And Dee's dad was a fellow, and he always told me that was every bit as hard, as not harder than getting a PhD in mathematics. <laughs> anyway. Uh, uh, 
The structure, structure of financial derivatives is one that showed up in the 2008 financial crisis. So that these derivatives are very complex and they are based on futures and options, if you know about that, but they're futures and options are contracts where you're gonna do something down, down the road and you pay for these. And anyway, they used intricate probability calculations to structure these things. In the decryption of co coded messages, that's kind of in in interesting. That is this. So, Alan, Alan Turing was a mathematician. There was a movie about him recently called The Imitation Game. I don't know if any of you saw that, but it was, he worked at Bletchley Park and Bletchley Park in, in London during the Second World War when they were trying to decode the German Enigma code. And they used letter frequencies. Right? So if I look at the alphabet, you know, some letters appear much more frequently than others. And you can actually have the, the values of those. And they looked at actually see frequencies for pairs of, of letters and did some use probability very heavily to use that to break the enigma code. Oh no. Let me look just a minute. There I go. Uh, I want to get a, get along in here and just before I break do do one thing here. So this is so this is a kind of a probability puzzle that appeared a while ago, and at the time there was this woman Marilyn Vassalant. Do you remember her that wrote for wrote a column in the newspaper in Parade Magazine? Claimed she was the smartest person in the world, had the highest I, I, IQ. So the anyway this this problem ended up in in her column also. So here here's the deal. This is. You're at this game show with Monty Hall, and there are three curtains. And you've won the first rounds or whatever. And so what you get to do is pick one of the curtains and win what's behind it. Well, behind it, there's a goat and, and these two SUVs. But you're very green-minded, so what you would like to do is win the goat. You don't want one of those ugly SUVs. Okay. So let's, let's go back. So what... So what you're going to do is walk up to one of the curtains and say, I'd like this one. Right? And you're going to lift the curtain, and then you get what's behind it. And just as you're about to lift your curtain, Monty Hall walks over, and he lifts up one of the other curtains and shows you an SUV. Right? Now remember, you want the goat. So the question is, and he says, you may switch if you would like to. Okay. So do you want to switch or not? You want to stay where you are? Okay. So let's 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 stop here and have have questions and we'll come back and we'll get this started when when we we return after a break. Yeah. They'll take the mic around. Huh? They'll take the mic around. Oh, they do. They, oh, they, 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 they choose. Yeah, that's yeah, fine. Yeah. Right here. My name is Joel, and uh, I play bridge with some guys and uh, every week, and uh, for years I have. And there's this one guy that defies all laws of probability because he wins all the time. We're like an extra in Mike's movie. And so is there any research that's been done that documents that some people do somehow tie into the cosmos and bring that in? I'm convinced there is.
What, what's he playing? Player. What, what's he playing? Well, is there some reason why? What, 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 what's the game that he's playing? Bridge. Play bridge. bridge. Playing bridge. Well, you know, but see, so bridge is not random, right? I mean, bridge. Uh, I mean, it's not like 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 when I, if I'm playing five card poker, then you know I guess I can I, I can bluff and, and so on. But if I were just what I'm looking at is just dealing the cards and no intelligence on your part, having anything to do with how those poker hands are are rated. So, so but bridge, I mean, there's a lot of intelligence that comes into play in the in the bidding and the play of the cards. <laughs> Well, or not. <laughs> yeah. Very tactfully put. <laughs> this, is, this is Roger. And in the law of large numbers that you mentioned, you approach an average. And am I correct in assuming that if you graph that, the approach would be asymptotic? Yeah, I th 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 that's kind of what it means to, for them to, to say that as, as you do it longer and longer, then it's asymptotic to the value. So like if I flip a coin, you know, many, many times, but it's the average that's asymptotic to a half, not, not the number of, of heads is not asymptotic to, to the value. Yeah. So you could choose... You, you, you could choose a, a value, say, that I'd like to be within so much of a half, and most of the time, eventually, you'd, you'd, you'd get within your margin of error then. Hi. Uh, uh, my name's Eric, and I, I believe that uh, uh, Pascal is also known for Pascal's wager, which in a way is a theory of probability, and uh, one of his remarks on religion was, if, if there is a God and I believe in God, I win everything. If there is a God and I don't believe in God, I lose everything. He's talking about, he's talking about Pascal's, Pascal's the same guy who did Pascal's wager. Did he, did, did he? I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, but I don't think that he did. And, and, and it, it was interesting too. It, I don't know a, a lot about him, but it, but he did this correspondence with Fermat for like over a year, and then it was shortly after that he essentially kind of pulled himself back from society and tried to figure out for himself about religion and what life was all about. And that's when he wrote Pensees, and, and so he didn't have much interaction with the other world at all. Um, hi, my name's Becky, and I recently read a book called The Black Swan, which attacks probability theory, among other ways that we make decisions about predicting catastrophic events. So I wonder if you'd comment on that, on how probability theory is, is or is not able to predict catastrophic events. She wants to know if probability theory helps us predict catastrophic events. That's what I don't think probability theory helps. You, you know, there, there's some use of probability in, in chaos theory, but I don't, I, I don't know how they, what, how they u use that. So assume yes and no, <laughs> yeah, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Jeanette, uh, do you use this when you gamble or is this an advantage? Yeah, you don't gamble. <laughs> is it? I'm, I'm too cheap. <laughs> Me too. 
you know, the, the only thing I know, that, you know, for a, for a while, and I don't know whether they changed the rules, but, but in blackjack, the, 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 the probability is for the house if you did a fresh deck every time. And so people tried to devise schemes where they counted cards so they knew what was left in the, in the deck, which, which might change the odds to be for the player instead of for the house. And I know there were guys that went in and did that and actually made some money, but then I think that the casinos changed, and I don't know what they do now, whether they redeal the deck every time or, or what, but, but yeah, so, so in that sense, probability was, you know, people, but, you know, there's not much to do against, you know, the same at a craps table. I mean, the, the, the probability of winning a craps is just a little bit below 50%. But, you know, it's that little bit above 50% that the casino has that they don't, they don't care if you win once in a while. Okay, this is Wayne. Uh, you mentioned uh, squaring 17. You can actually do that in your head pretty easily if you take square 17, change it to 17 times 17. Notice that 20 times 14 is an easier uh, expression to deal with. And then all you have to do is take that 3 you added to the 17 and the 3 you took away, square that, and add that to your uh, 240, or two, 280. He's talking about an easy way to square 17. Uh, it's, it is it's, easy. It's kind of an easy way to <laughs> Try square it for a while. 17. <laughs> <laughs> Prove it, Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe after that question, maybe we should right. take our break. Yeah. Did it, did it, did I'll it. try harder. All right. Well, welcome back. All right. So here are the three curtains. And you have to, have to bear with me here, but the, go the goat is the prize, not the SUVs. All right. The SUVs you lose. You don't, you don't want those. Okay. So we go go back. So so the contestant, think of us, think of yourself. You go up and and you pick one of the curtains, and you don't know what's behind there. Monty knows. Okay. So you pick a curtain, and you're just about ready to lift it up and see whether you got the goat or not. And just as you're ready to do that, Monty goes over to one of the other curtains and lifts it up and shows you an SUV, okay? So the question is, do you want to, he says you can switch if you like. So do you want to switch or not? Okay, so, so let's look at this. So there we are, okay? And, and we don't, they're, they're not necessarily in this, in this order. So I've picked one, one of these. So I could equally likely have the GOAT or one of the two SUVs. Right? So, so let's look, look at the possibilities. Right? I'm going to look at the possibility where I picked the GOAT. I'm going to look at the possibility where I picked the first SUV and the possibility I looked at the second SUV. Th three possibilities. And each one of those, I'm going to say, what happens if I switch? Right? So let's do that. All right. So suppose the curtain I've picked has the goat behind it. Okay. Then Monty Hall is going to lift up the curtain for one of the SUVs and show me. All right. And I switch. What happens? I lose the goat. Right. Okay. But suppose. I choose the curtain with the first SUV. What's Monty Hall got to do? He's got to show me that other SUV over there. And what happens if I switch? I win the gold, right? What happens if I pick the second SUV in the curtain? What's he got to show me? He's got to show me the first SUV. I switch and I win the gold. So two out of three times I win by switching. You want to do that again? <laughs> 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 
two-thirds of the time I win by switching. Okay, so we're back to, so we did some kind of early probability things and some poker, roulette and make a box. I want to look, look at a, a couple of these. So sitting down here is a friend, Francis Chapa, who a, was a professor of chemistry at Atwalamet, and, and she right away recognized mechanum quantics, mechanics. And that's all built on probability distributions of where the electrons are. So lots and lots of probability in that. Okay, I'm going to look at statistical sampling. So this is the Florence Nightingale that you all know. There's the true foundation of theology is to ascertain the character of God. It's by the aid of statistics that law in the social sphere can be ascertained and codified and certain aspects of the character of God thereby revealed. The study of statistics is thus a religious service. <laughs> she was a very good statistician, by the way, besides being a wonderful nurse in the Crimean War. Right. So this is Sir Francis Galton. We're gonna, so one of the big results we looked at before break was the law of averages. This is another important result in, in probability theory is called the central limit theorem. And it wasn't called the central limit theorem in the beginning, but this is Francis Galton commenting on it. He says, I know of scarcely anything so apt to impress the imagination as the wonderful form of cosmic order expressed by the law of frequency of error. That's the central limit theorem. The law would have been personified by the Greeks and deified if they had known of it. It reigns with serenity and in complete self-effacement amidst the wildest confusion. The huger the mob and the, and the greater the apparent anarchy, the more perfect is its sway. It is the supreme law of unreason. Whenever a large sample of chaotic elements are taken in hand and marshaled in the order of their magnitude, an unsuspected and most beautiful form of regularity proofs have been latent all along. So. One of the first people to recognize a form of the central limit theorem was this Frenchman, Abraham de Mora. And what, what the diagram represents, this is called a hi histogram, where you can think of what I want to do is toss a fair coin, say a thousand times, and then toss it another thousand times, and another thousand times, and another thousand times. And in each one of those thousand times, I count the number of heads that I got. And then I'm going to keep track of those. You can think of putting them in bins. So one of those, one of those blue rectangles is a bin that holds the number of heads. Say so one of the bins represents maybe the number of heads from, from 450 to 500, right? And then it gets taller and taller as my thousand tosses gave me that number of, of heads. So you see that starts to take a shape right, as I do that many, many times. And that shape it takes is what we call the, the normal curve. Uh, so de Montfort's result was for random events like flipping a, a coin. La, la, Laplace, who we met earlier, that said great things about probability, proved a, a more general result. Then what I have here are just some different examples of normal curves. So the nor normal curves have two characteristics that define them, and there's a they're usually written with these Greek letters, mu and sigma. Mu starts with M, mean starts with M. Sigma starts with S, standard deviation starts with S. So that's what they stand for. So these four curves up there, there's a red, blue, yellow, and green, are all, are all normal curves. 
And what they differ in is in their means and standard deviations. So the green curve, so the, the mean is where, where they peak. Standard deviation tells how much they're spread out from that peak. So the green curve has a mean that's to the left of those other curves. And then the three, the, the yellow, the red, and the blue, all peak at the same value, but they're spread out differently. So those three on the right all have the same mean, but they have different standard deviations. There, there's actually a normal curve that's called the standard normal curve that has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And there are many tables tabulated for that standard normal curve. Any other normal curve, you can translate results from the standard normal curve to the normal curve you're interested in. So. so Gauss also gets his name attached to the normal curve, and he's the one that did, Gauss is pretty amazing. He was a scientist, mathematician, considered by most to be one of the three greatest mathematicians who ever lived, along with Arch Archimedes and Newton. So, not Gauss, but it's an, an astronomer observed Ceres with three different measurements back in 1801. And then, and he wasn't sure what, he named it Ceres, but he didn't know if this was a planet or not. And then Ceres went behind the sun. So, and it wasn't gonna come out for a year. And they wanted to calculate its orbit to see if it really was a planet or not. And so one of the things that some of these folks that worked in probability were interested in were measurements and errors. So when, so when somebody makes a measurement or an observation, you know, errors can come in through what the person does, through the instrument itself, to the, in the environment. So if I go out and measure something really carefully, I'm not gonna get the same value time after time after time. So Gauss worked on taking these three measurements and trying to analyze what the possible errors in measuring them might, might have been. And it turns out that he proves a very general result about the normal curve and how it can be used to, to figure out how the errors behave for all sorts of different measurements. So he gets his name attached to the normal curve. Sometimes the normal curve is called a bell curve because it's kind of bell-shaped also called a Gaussian. Okay. So this is to enlighten you. This is the formula for, for the normal curve. So it's kind of a complicated guy. So if you're into graphing and you graph this thing on the, on the right, you'd, you'd get a normal curve with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. Okay, so what the, what the central limit theorem says it's, it's been generalized and generalized up, so it's a pretty broad, pretty broad statement about what happens. So it says the distribution of a sum or an average of many random quantities closely follows a normal curve. Well, the way that plays out in, 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 in practice is if you have some characteristic that you're interested in, say height of people, that seems to be made up what, what determines someone's height is not a single gene, right, Grant? Right. <laughs> <laughs> that there are several different characteristics of your body plus your environment, right, that determine your height. So height, if I measure heights of a population, they'll tend to follow a norm, normal curve, right? So, no, so the normal curve just appears over and over again. It's not the only distribution in probability, but okay. so this is this, this, this is a standard norm, normal curve. So it's centered at zero, and then the one, two, three, and the minus one, two, three are, are standard deviations. So one is one standard deviation to the right, two is two standard deviations to the right. And what happens for all normal curves is that if I look one standard deviation to the left and one to the right, that 68% of the data falls in there. 
so I can think that, you know, probability that if you're measuring heights or whatever, that if you're in within one standard deviation of the mean, there's 68% of us. If I go out two standard deviations and I'm up to 95%, and three standard deviations, 99.7%. And then there's just a little tiny bit left in the tails that are outside of that. So here's a, this is a normal curve for the Stanford Binet test, which measures something. I'm sure people argue whether it really measures all of your in, in, in intelligence or not. There's actually two different IQ tests on here. The Stanford Binet is the second one down there. So they're centered at 100. And then for the Stanford Binet test, it's standard deviation is 16. So if you go 16 to the left and 16 to the right, that puts you between 84 and 116. So if your IQ, according to Stanford Binet, is there, there, that's where 65% of the people lie. Okay. Right. Go out two standard deviations, then I get 95%. So sometimes they talk about people being a three sigma, right? It means they're <laughs> way out there, one way or the other. <laughs> So one, one use that the normal curve makes is in sa sampling is to do what are called confidence inter intervals. So I'd like to go out and do a survey. Say I'm I interested in maybe the heights of, of college women. And so I'm going to go out and do a random sample and measure those women in my sample. But what I'd like to know is you know, what the, so it, you, if I did that over at Willamette and did a different one at TIUA over here where we are, I'd probably find a difference, not only in the mean, but I'd find a difference in how the heights vary from that mean. I'd, I'd expect the TIUA students to probably be more homogeneous. Right? So I want to know when I do my test, I'm, I'm going to say, you know, it's, 65 inches or 66 inches, whatever, but I'd like to say plus or minus. Right? And so that's what confidence in intervals are. And so the confidence interval is if I feel like I'm doing this from a population and if I do enough, I'm going to follow the, the, the normal curve. These numbers on the right are taken from a standard normal table. So that 1.645 is if you go out 1.645 standard deviations each way, that includes 90% of the normal curve. Okay. Go out that far. If I go out 1.96 standard deviations each way, then I take in 95% of the normal curve. So people are going to talk about, I'm going to do a confidence interval. Do I want 90% confidence? Do I want 95% confidence? So I choose those numbers, and then there's a formula down here. So that Z star is the number from the table. So I do the sample mean, and then I do a calculation that, that involves the standard deviation for the population and this normal value. Right? And I take my mean and then do plus or minus that amount. So in this case, I, with the numbers I've given up there, I get an interval of... 64 and a half to 66 and a half in inches, and I'd say I'm 90% I'm confident. What? Okay. The reason I don't say that's a sure thing is I did this random sample, and you know I was careful in doing that. It's hard to get a random sample, but people people work 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 hard hard to do that. But maybe I, I still didn't get something that was representative e e e e enough. So this interval may or may not really have the true mean of all of the college students in there. So anyway. So sometimes in the newspaper, they'll just tell us the, the, the mean, and they might say that might give us the confidence or plus or minus error. 
going to do another one on medical testing. Okay. So this is going to introduce a new, uh, a new concept called conditional probability. So th this, so I made up some, some, some numbers here to il illustrate a point. So let's say flibrogitis is a rare disease, and we've developed a test for flibrogitis. Okay? But it turns out this, this disease, there's only one in 2,000 people that have it. Okay? So the probability that you have flibrogitis is 0.0005. Okay? Now these next two are what's called conditional probabilities. They have that slash in there. So that first one is the probability that the test shows positive if you have flibrogitis. Okay? And that's 95%. Let's make up that up. Okay. The next one is the probability that the test shows positive if you're healthy. 4%. So that's a false positive. All right. Those people really didn't have the disease, but test showed up positive for it. So the question is, suppose I go in, I'm sick, and they give me this test for flibrogitis. Right? So I want to know. I don't want to know the probabilities, those are probabilities up above. I want to know what's the probability that if the test showed up positive that I've got the disease. Okay. So we're going to look at a way to turn these numbers around to get at that bottom one. So first of all, I want to look at conditional probability. A bit. So I've got a population. That's the big ring around, say a bunch of people in there. And I've got two different groups. I've got that red group and the black group on the inside. And they overlap some in that shaded area. Okay. So the inner black is A and the inner red is Z. So I want to know the probability that if Z is true, that A will be true. Okay. So to say that Z is true means that we're really inside the red circle. Okay? I've, I've cut the population down. I say, hey, I know, I know Z is true, so I'm inside the red circle. I want to know what's the probability that you're also inside the black circle. So I want to know what's the probability of that hatched area. Okay? So that's the numerator, the probability of A and Z. Okay? Now, why is the denominator in there? The denominator is in there to kind of normalize this, to make that conditional probability a true probability. So that if I look at the probability of z given z, I get a 1. So I've shrunk down from the big loop to the smaller black loop, right? By dividing out the pro I mean, sorry, to the smaller, to the smaller red, red group by dividing out the probability of z. So this is, this is how you calculate conditional probability. No? Okay, so that's the same formula up, up at the top, right? Now don't, don't, don't glaze over too much on me. <laughs> so kind of third, third thing we're going to talk about, so we talked about the law of averages and the central limit theorem. This is called Bayes' formula. And what Bayes' formula allows you to do is to turn that conditional probability around. So what I want to do is suppose I know the probability of A given Z, how do I calculate the probability of Z given A? Okay. So if I write down, down here, the probability of Z given A, I'm just going to take this formula up above and flip the A's and Z's around. So I get this guy. Probability of Z given A is probability of Z and A over probability of A. But so the denominators are different, but even though those numerators say A and Z, A and Z is the same thing as Z and A. So those numerators are really the same thing. So what I can do is take this numerator here, knowing it's the same as that one, solve this equation for that. And so for probability of A and Z, I plug in probability of A given Z times probability of Z, and I get this down here. So that says the probability of Z given A 
can be computed from the probability of A given Z times probability of Z over probability of A. And this is Bayes' formula. It's very simple, but it's powerful. <laughs> and, it's, you know, and it's so amazing. I talked a little about Turing and, and breaking the German Enigma code. One of, his, one of his big insights was to use Bayes' formula. And it was so important in that that it wasn't until just maybe 15 years ago that they let out that that's what they did during the Second World War. Yeah. So anyway, we're going on. All right. So this is the this is Bayes' formula up at the top, and I'm going to do this for flibrogitis with with the numbers we had, and you plug them into that, and you get 1.2 percent. So that says the probability that you're sick, given the test is positive, is 1.2 percent. Well, so what, what happened is that this is a rare disease, and in order to detect that, you need a really, really good test. Right? If, if I go back, go way, way back, see there was these, these two probabilities down at the bottom of when does the test show positive, I got to get those numbers. I got to get that 0.95 up and I got to get that 0.04 down to have a good test. Otherwise, the test is not going to help me. Anyway. Okay. Oh, this is a Mathematician, physicist, John von Neumann, hungry, worked, uh, did some really important things in mathematics and, and in physics, in quantum theory. And in 1944, he had actually worked on this before. He wrote a book with Oscar Morgenstern called Theory of Games and Economic Behavior. So this is not board games, right? Uh, He, he was one of, of a group of Hungarian scientists that worked in the United States, along with Edward Teller and Leo Zillard, and there were more. As a joke goes, at one time when the National Academy of Science met back in Washington, D.C., they said, well, should we do our meeting in English or our native language Hungarian? <laughs> so there's a corporation. That, have you heard of the Rand Corporation down in Santa Monica? This is a, it's a nonprofit, but it has a lot of government funding. And it's kind of a, it's a think, think tank. And this is their, their statement about some of the things they do. So they've worked a lot with the military on, on war games and on strategies. If the U.S. Navy is meeting the Chinese Navy in the China Sea. I'm going to do one, one, one example of, of, of game, game theory. Uh, this is from a book written by one, a guy who worked at Rand. So this happens on a Mississippi River boat, right? So Steve is the guy sitting there quietly, and a stranger walks up, flipping a coin, and says, he says, we're too lazy to flip coins, so we're just going to call out heads, heads or tails. He says, okay. He says, I'll pay you $30 when I call tails and you call heads, and $10 when it's the other way around. And just to make it fair, you give me $20 when we match. Okay, <laughs> so here's, here's what's called the payoff matrix. So th th these sometimes are called games of strategy. And you can have some in which people cooperate. I know this, in another movie a few years ago called Brilliant Mind about John Nash that won a Nobel Prize in economics for his work in, in, in game theory. Okay. So th this is a game of conflict, okay? So you assume that these are two rational people that have different interests. They each want to win. Uh -huh. So 
Oh. I'm getting a, I'm not seeing it. There we go. So here's St Steve can either call heads or tails. Stranger can call heads or tails. So when they match, so this is viewed by Steve. So, so when they match, he loses $20. He has to pay the stranger $20. Okay, if Steve calls heads and the stranger calls tails, then the stranger has to pay him $30. The other way around, tails and heads, stranger has to pay him $10. This is called a zero-sum game because the, the total of the wins and losses, counting the losses as negative, adds up to zero. So you could have a non-zero-sum game if what they had to do is pay the riverboat five bucks every time they played. Uh, to have a, have a strategy for this, the way the game theory works is a strategy doesn't mean like I'm going to be aggressive or not aggressive. What it means is that I have to write down the, the rules of how I'm going to play so that a robot could do that. So I have to write down rules that are contingent on whatever the other person does here, here's how I'm going to react. Okay. So the stranger does an analysis, and he says, I'm going to do a mixed strategy of calling H five out of eight times. Okay. So how does Stray Steve do against this strategy? Well, when Steve calls heads, remember the stranger's calling, he's calling heads five-eighths of the times and tails three-eighths of the times. So we're in this row here, Steve calling heads. So he loses $20 five-eighths of the times and wins $30 three-eighths of the time. So he loses a buck and a quarter long run. What if he calls tails? Then he wins $10 five-eighths of the time and he loses $20 three-eighths of the time. So he loses a buck and a quarter in the long run. So there's nothing he can do, right? He can do and mix. Steve can mix his heads and tails how he likes. He's going to end up losing a buck and a quarter in the long run every time they play. So these. So there's a there's there's an algorithm for calculating why Steve, why I'm sorry, why the stranger chose his five eighths, three eighths, and it's a pretty simple calculation. But anyway, it is using probability. Well, this is. This is, this is Turing that I talked about. Uh, kind of sad, sad story about what happened to him. But anyway, he was brilliant. That's this one, a cottage where he worked at Bletchley Park, breaking the German Enigma code. Yeah. Oh, these are, this goes with my caskets. This is Jeanette. My question is, uh, is there a way for us to use that? Or is that only for, you know, people who focus on predictions and studying this in insignificant ways? I, I mean, well, that's probably clear enough. She's wondering. I think the way you use it is to be aware, right? That if, like we talked about, if you're, if you're going to gamble, be aware that in the long run you're going to use and do it for reasons other than wanting to win. 
<laughs> right? And the law, law of averages says you shouldn't think because you've lost five times in a row that I'm going to win the next time. And I suppose it helps you in, in, in interpret what it means when you get the weather forecast. What do they mean by there's going to be a certain percent that's going to rain? And I understand that's not a guaranteed thing. You want to Check. add something? Well, and you might be using it even though you're not using it. In other words, if it has to do with medical tests and so forth, you may be a beneficiary even though you, Jeanette, haven't done some weird calculations and had to worry about numerators and denominators. Jinx, over here. About 15 or 17 years ago, someone within PERS discovered that no one had updated the actuarial tables for those of us who are retiring. And there was a, a kind of collective gasp of, uh-oh. And they decided to do it all in one fell swoop, which didn't help those of us who were thinking of retiring. How often do these actuarial tables get straightened out or adapted? And what's a fair way to deal that? So By the way, I tried to retire, then it made me mad. How often do they get updated? Right. Do they get updated very often. For what tables are you talking about? Actuarial. Oh yeah. So the, the, for for like for 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 in, in in insurance premiums. Oh yeah, they they have the folks working on those all, all the time. I mean, do do they I mean do do they change for? Well, they 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 change depending on certainly on even on your own own records, right? That if you have accidents, then your car insurance is, is going to go up. But the tables that they work from, those, those, those are not done lo locally. Those are all done at the, you know, the places where the actuaries work. I don't think Salem has an actuary. I don't think, don't, don't don't know that. But they they sit in places like I said, like Chicago and Los Angeles, Hart Hartford, Connecticut. But yeah. You know. So, so they help structure the the policies, and I, well, I know that like D and I have long-term care, and we bought it a few years ago when uh, long-term care insurance policies were kind of a reasonable price, and I think they were a new instrument for the insurance companies, and what they found out is that they're spending out a lot more money than what the premiums are going in, and they're kicking the premiums up. Now they have to go through the state. You know, they have to get approval, but then what they do is show the state as, hey, here's what our costs are and here's what our premiums are. We're not making money on these. But, but those, I mean, they, they keep really close track of what's going on. Oh, uh, Paul up here, over, uh, over here. Um, in doing a lot of, uh, oh, I took a lot of science courses, and people are doing experiments and gathering data all the time, and uh, usually at the end of where there's any conclusions about something happening, they use a certain kind of statistical analysis to evaluate the data. But what happens in many cases when people will go back and look at what statistical analysis they used it was incorrect and it swayed the data. So can you talk a little bit about statistical analysis, uh, the proper statistical analysis in evaluating data? So he's saying, is there a different statistical method? Different statistical methods get used to evaluate data and sometimes we use the wrong method. And so what do we do about that? You know, are you, are you talking about personally, or, or I mean, he just means what? he's just talking about whether there are ways that we can determine the proper statistical methods. Oh yeah, so, so 
I mean, we just, I just talked about the, the norm, normal curve, but there are a lot of other probability distributions you've probably heard of, like a chi-squared test or a t-test, or, right? And so the, the, the person doing the study has to make some evaluation of the data and the situation he's in, which, which of those curves, if any, might, might apply. There's also a lot of work done, and when, you, when I don't assume any, any one of those particular distributions, how do I st just study data that I don't know much about? And there's a lot of work done in that. Of call, it's called non-parametric statistics. But, you know, so that's a challenge, but that's what, you know, why people study statistics and study it in business schools and you know, what economics. Uh, hello, Richard. Thank you so much for giving us this lecture. It just occurred to me that as you were talking about the normal curves and the bell-shaped curves, and you used IQ, the Stanford Binet, which was set about 40 or 50 years ago. I'm wondering, uh, is there any, do you know of any organization that maybe is re- testing for human IQ. In other words, as we learn to um, process more quickly and with the advent of the internet and information highway and iPhones and texting, shouldn't we be making a new curve for human IQ? Meredith, I think that, like on the Stanford Binet test, that they, they update what the questions are. I think the questions now are much different than they were when they first, first began the, 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 the test. And, and there have been lots of questions about what, you know, like same on SAT tests, what do they really test? So that's, you know, you know I'm sure that there's aspects of, of intelligence that don't show up on the Stanford Binet test. You know, when we talked about the normal curve, there's lots of data, too, that aren't, aren't normal. If you look at, like, e income for families, then, then it, and, and I look at the shape of, you know, the vertical axis would be the number of people at a particular e income, then it has a long right-hand tail. I mean, they're not, you know, most of the people are grouped kind of in here, and then there's the really wealthy folks out here, but it doesn't go that way. So, yeah, there are a lot of things that aren't normal, but it's kind of amazing how many things that are. Uh, hello. I might go on here. I think I am. Uh, George in the back here. Um, it seems like uh, whether people are doing research in social science or natural sciences, there's always a lot of data. They've got to analyze and present uh, a paper, a conclusion, or, and get it published, that sort of thing. Uh, it's almost like they need statisticians uh, on a retainer, kind of like you need a lawyer if you get in trouble. Uh, are there enough statisticians around? Uh, are these people using the proper statistics? Because they're not necessarily well trained in statistics. Well, he's saying a lot of people doing scientific studies and they maybe don't know the statistics. And, and are there enough statisticians around? And my answer. Uh, and, and I'm you know, not a practicing statistician, so I don't know, but I know that you know, my experience in working with a statistics group for a while was that, you know, like the other scientists would, would, would come to the statistics group to get help with if they were trying to do some sort of data analysis that required statisticians. And I don't, you know, I don't think you can probably get a PhD in social science now without studying a lot of statistics. And most of the people I know in social science know, you know, there are big software programs that do a lot of statistical analysis. Uh, one of them, in fact, is written just for people in the medical field. Right? I can't remember what, MedCat, no. 
any, any way. I, you know, there's a lot of help if people want it. And, and I think the people are, are aware of that most of the time that I know. Yeah, I, I might just add that in my own case, and of course I got my PhD back in the dark ages, we still had statistics courses that were designed for the area that we were studying. And that doesn't mean we wouldn't have to pursue more when we were at the dissertation stage, but certainly we're taking, st in psychology, it might be more chi-square and, and tests like that, and economics, it was, it, it, it might have, we took, in fact, we had a, uh, a field of study called econometrics, we still do. And there we're really integrating mathematics and, and statistics and economic theory, and I think that for the most part, uh, people in the sciences or in the social, social sciences are getting a pretty good dose of, of statistical theory. Uh, hi, Richard. Uh, this is Mike. Um, I'm just wondering if in the mathematical uh, community in Oregon, that when you get together over tea or uh, <laughs> uh, that there's any insight or, insight or consensus about what Oregon did wrong with PERS? Uh, when the statisticians get together, is there agreement about what they did wrong with PERS? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to answer? <laughs> Oh, no. Is there a reporter here in the crowd that's going <laughs> to... That's an intelligent answer. <laughs> on some of these calculations on uh, actuarial, I, I think they forgot to include average life expectancy and what would happen to your payments if you lived longer than you were predicted by average? I mean, are you talking about like a life insurance policy? Well, if you're on an annuity, the, the annuities are calculated based on mortality tables, so they assume, you know, on the average, that their payout's going to work out, that there's going to be some people that are die before the annuity finishes, and some will live, live longer. But, I mean, they, you know, if you, if when you retired from PERS, you converted your money to an annuity instead of taking it out and investing it your, yourself, those payments are based on mortality tables. They're based on averages, right? About, and some people are going to you know, lose on that, and some people are going to gain on that. Some people are going to die early, and they could have had more money if they took the, the, the lump sum payment to begin with. But yeah. but yeah, they try to calculate that, so they got enough money <laughs> to, to keep paying you. My uh, physician does not like the idea when I bring up Bayer's theorem as far as uh, PSA test. And they keep, every time I have a blood test, I got to tell them, not the PSA. Have anybody else found that? I'm so, could you say that again, Wayne? The, uh, the PSA test comes out very poorly uh, when you go through Bayer's formula. And I okay. told my physician, that I didn't want a PSA test because the Bayer uh, theorem comes out pretty, the results come out poor for the PSA. Yeah. But they, every time I have a blood test, there's a PSA snuck in there that I, that I end up refusing. He's saying the PSA, PSA test is not a good test and he can't seem to convince his doctor that, that he's PSA to the PSA, you know, the, the yeah. Wayne, I, yeah, I mean, some, 
Some schools have dropped the SAT exam. Oh, PS, it, 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 the, no, the not the, the PSAT. Blood, the blood test. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I misunderstood. My fault. Do you know about the PS? Oh, the, yeah. Uh, Wayne, I don't, I don't know enough about that. I mean, about whether, yeah, I know, I know a lot of people, a lot of doctors don't do PSA tests any, 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 anymore. Uh, I have a friend who's got a son-in-law that's a high-blown doctor, says, males over 65, you got, you got cancer cells in your prostate, and some of those are going to grow and take you over, and some aren't. So. A pretty sound statistical reasoning. <laughs> uh, hi, this is George. What, one of the areas that we're all exposed to statistics is political polls. We see them on television, you know, every evening. 31% feel this way, blah, blah, blah. And we hear it all the time. And we look at those numbers, we say, they can't be true. <laughs> well, a lot of it is a function of the population that's sampled and those people that don't respond to the poll. You know, they bias the results. But... Do you know of any process that anybody goes through, the, the producers of these shows, to check the, the statistics or the process used to develop those numbers? I think he's talking about political polls and whether they're really representative uh, and how we, how we can make them more representative. You, you, you're not talking about like gerrymandering. No, no I'm no. talking about the numbers we see on the news every evening about so many people numbers. feel this yeah. way or so many people feel that way. So many people feel, you know, they're in favor of Kavanaugh or they're against Kavanaugh. Yeah, I don't know. Do you, do you know? Yeah. Well, uh, I know there have been some horrendous mistakes made in the past when we use telephone polls and, of course, not taking into account what kind of people had telephones. This is way back. Right. And so, you know, it, I think Dick said this earlier, but getting a representative sample is tricky business. And, it, you know, it takes uh, good judgment. And I don't think there's any formula out there to, to guarantee good judgment. Um, but that's what I'd say about it. But I'm not the speaker, so I can't. <laughs> So you can take that for what it's worth. <laughs> See, there, you know, there are all, all kinds of errors that come in in sampling. One of, probably one of the most common is called a response error, that if, if you send out forms to household and say, you know, what's your attitude on these particular issues? Well, the people that are going to respond are people that feel strongly one way or the other. And a lot of folks that, yeah, don't turn. So you, so you don't get a representative sample that way. So you can ameliorate that some by kind of keeping track and then going out and going door to door and making phone calls, but it's, it's, tough, to, it's tough to get a random sample. It doesn't happen by chance. Or it does happen by chance. Well, thank you. Well, I, appreciate, uh, I do appreciate uh, it. And I want to... <laughs>